This lecture is about the U.S.-Mexican War. This lecture can also be called the U.S. Invasion of Mexico. There is plenty of evidence, historical evidence, that shows that this was a provoked war by the United States to acquire what is today considered the American Southwest, the former Mexican Northern Territories. The, the image that you are looking at is an image that shows the character of Colombia. Colombia represents manifest destiny. She wears a star on her forehead. She carries a book on her right hand that represents education and knowledge. And she's holding the cables for electricity and a telegraph line on her hand. If you observe this image, you can see a contrast between darkness and light. On one end, on the left hand side, you can see a storm in the sky as well as the water. You can see buffalo and Native American people running away from settlers from pioneers from miners from farmers you can see on the right hand side the train a wagon a couple of wagons more than one train and a port that is showing progress is showing quote and quote, civilization. You can see the contrast of one thing and another, and this represents the idea of manifest destiny. The idea that one civilization is superior than the other, that one civilization is meant by destiny to uh, expand, to take over, from ocean to ocean without taking into consideration who is living in those lands. Remember in other lectures the past we talked about the ideas of the loss of discovery or the ideas that led Christopher Columbus uh, to the Americas. Okay? So this is Manifest Destiny. This is a very popular painting that describes this historical period. So let's go into the months and the ideas behind the U.S. Mexican War. There is a landmass of about a, a 150 miles on the Mexico Texas border that for a while has been uh, years in the 1830s, 1840s disputed. This landmass is the land between the Rio Grande. You can look at the image on, on the right hand side of this slide and you can see the Rio Grande and Rio Nueces and there's a gap of land between those two by the Gulf Coast and that is a uh, landmass of, or a land of, of about 150 square miles and that is a territory that became disputed and this is also the place where the U.S.-Mexican War began. But before 
the actual fighting happen or the actual uh, battles happen in the U.S. Mexican War. There is a background to all of this. And the background to this is Texas. And the map on the left hand side, you can see different colors. Each one of these colors represents a period of Texas. And the initial map that you want to pay attention to is Texas as a whole. And then in 1836, Texas declares its independence from Mexico. This is a year of the Alamo. From 1836 to 1845, Texas is in the eyes of people living in Texas, an independent republic. In the eyes of Mexico, Texas is still part of Mexico until the end of the U.S.-Mexican War in 1848. The red dotted space in the map represents disputed territory that was claimed by the northern Mexican states south of Texas, including Nuevo Mexico, Tamaulipas, Coahuila, and Nuevo León. And then the light blue color, light blue dotted color, represents the territories that were lost by Mexico in 1848. And then the dark blue color in the map represents Mexico after 1848. In other words, Mexico loses about half of its territory to the United States due to this war. Before the Texas issue, Mexico had a very small population of people living in Texas, Mexico, and Tejanos, people of Texas from Mexican descent, invited and advocated for the admission and the invitation of Anglos into Mexican Texas. To the point that Anglos um, came in big numbers, and at one point, there were five Anglos to every Mexican by around 1830. And this is what eventually leads to Texas independence. It's important to keep in mind that the United States was well aware that Mexico was going through a very unstable, unstable uh, political time in Mexico City. Mexico City had very short-lived presidents in office. Those presidents lasted from four to six months, and this was a perfect opportunity for the United States to provoke Mexico into a war. For example, on December 1845, when the United States is voting to annex Texas as a state in the United States, Mexico has a president for about a month. Before that, this was happening, and as you can see here, you have a list of presidents that come in and out of office. And this is going to uh, create all kinds of issues for Mexico. Some of these presidents uh, ruled twice. For example, Pedro Maria de Anaya. Antonio Lopez de Santana was on and off. And this is going to uh, be something that is going to affect Mexico in a very negative way. And it's going to help the United States uh, achieve victory in this conflict. When you compare these two nations, you can see uh, that there is, there are differences, and these differences give advantages to one nation over the other. The United States in the 1840s was a booming economy, a country that was receiving immigrants from Europe and was moving forward, 
while Mexico was a struggling economy because of its past and recent um, events that were happening in Mexico City where you have uh, political adversaries fighting each other. And also because in the 1840s, Mexico had already been going through many things, including a, an independence movement about 25 years before. They had debt that they needed to pay. Uh, in 1829, Spain tried to take back uh, Mexico into its colonial uh, control uh, unsuccessfully. So Mexico is a country that is trying to survive and is barely being born. And the United States has already some advantage over Mexico. Mexico is experiencing too many internal divisions between centralist and liberal uh, factions of the government. The United States is aggressive and land hungry. They're, they've been expanding and they will continue to expand. The United States is a nation that is uh, independent from England and on one, in one occasion has already challenged England, uh, actually a couple of occasions. The first one was independence. Second one is the War of 1812 when the United States and Canada go to war. Uh, Mexico, on the other hand, is in debt with England. And at one point, the United States uh, suspected that Mexico had uh, sold California to England because of this debt that they had with England. Mexico inherited the caste system from Spain, even though after 1821, Mexico was not supposed to be practicing this system. A lot of the traditions remain in Mexico, where people were seen and treated based on their uh, social and racial status. On the other hand, the United States is a nation that embraced racial superiority from the beginning, and that was based on white supremacy. And because of the reformation or the separation between the Catholic and Church of England, the Catholic Church and the Church of England, um, Anglos or people of the United States saw uh, the Catholic Church and Catholics as inferior. So you want to keep this in mind as we go forward and look into this um, conflict. In November of 1845, John Slidell goes to Mexico City. John Slidell is a, the U.S. ambassador to Mexico. He goes to Mexico City to uh, ask for a meeting with the Mexican president in turn, which is General Mariano, uh, excuse me, U.S. Ambassador John Sladell visited Mexico City to uh, ask for an audience with President Herrera, who is in office. And the reason why he wants to visit Herrera is because the United States is ready to negotiate with Mexico about the other territories other than Texas. In the eyes of the United States and the people of Texas, the Texas issue or the territory of Texas, it's already something of the past. It's not even a conversation that Sladeo is ready to discuss. In the mind of the Mexican government, Texas is still an issue that hasn't been resolved. And therefore, Texas is still a territory that belongs to Mexico. And for this reason, President Herrera meets in secret with Sladell to discuss the Texas issue. However, as I said, Sladell is looking for recognition of the Rio Grande as a border with Texas because he sees the Texas issue as something in the past. <clears throat> Additionally, Sladell is in Mexico to offer $5 million for New Mexico and $25 million for California. He wants to, on behalf of the United States, purchase this land for the United States. And part of the reason for this is because, uh, as you know, the, uh, the United States purchased the Louisiana territory from the French, and they feel that they can do the same thing with Mexico. However, Mexico is not interested in selling and as I said, Mexico and the Mexican government does not 
recognize Texas as being an independent nation. And when Texas becomes a state of the United States, this is going to become an issue. The media finds out about this secret meeting between President Herrera and John Sladell, the U.S. the U.S. Uh, ambassador to Mexico, and this is going to be very dramatic. As a consequence of this, General Mariano Paredes overthrows President Herrera over this situation, and the first thing that President Mariano Paredes does is that he reinforces the Mexican border or the, or the, the disputed territory with troops. He sends uh, troops to the border or to the new border or to the disputed territory. The Mexican president takes uh, the visit of Sladell in secret as a great offense and uh, refuses to negotiate with John Sladell and he reminds the United States that Texas is still a territory of Mexico. This is a time of high conflict uh, that is going to take us to the next stage or the next situation. And this is December of 1845 when Texas becomes the topic of uh, discussion for the U.S. Congress where the Congress decides to annex Texas as a state of the United States in December of 1845 under President Tyler. As a consequence of this, because Mexico is already mad about the current situation, Mexico decides to break off relations in protest against the United States. The eyes of the United States, all of this is a done deal. They're ready to move on. But Mexico, this is not the case. They are not ready to move on because Texas was never recognized as an independent nation. Therefore, they could never be in a state of the United States without the recognition of the Mexican Congress, which never happened. By January of 1845, James Polk becomes president. Texas is a done deal for, for the U.S. government and for the people of Texas. And President Polk makes expansion and manifest destiny part of his mission and his presidency. By March of 1846, John Sladell returns to the U.S. He was not aware of any of these doings because communication at this time wasn't as efficient as it is today. And as soon as President Polk becomes president of the United States, he orders General Zachary Taylor to protect the border and to send 4,000 U.S. troops to this disputed ter territory. And the next thing that the United States will do is they will send Navy ships to the Mexican coast in the Gulf Coast of Mexico, but also in California to blockade the Mexican ports and any type of help that Mexico can get from anyone. The general that was in charge of protecting the Mexican border was General Mariano Arista. Mariano Arista tells, sends a message to General Taylor to move his troops from disputed territory. And instead of moving those troops, General Taylor decides to move the troops further into the Rio Grande area. Uh, General Mariano Arista finds himself in a situation where he needs to make a decision and he has been given permission by President Paredes to attack the U.S. troops if they cross into this territory. Again, the United States wants a war against Mexico because they want the territory that Mexico wasn't willing to sell. And the best way to push Mexico into a situation is to provoke him into a war. And they are successful at this because Mexico has to protect itself. And Mexico decides to uh, attack the U.S. troops, specifically U.S. Marines. And this gives 
President Polk what he wanted, which is a reason why to go to war against Mexico. While President Polk uh, is dealing with all of this, he comes up with a way to present this to the Congress, and he does. And what you're looking at here is a quote by President Polk in which he speaks to Congress, pretty much telling Congress that American blood has been shed in American soil and that Mexico has provoked the United States into war. And this is what is used as a way to get support from U.S. Congress to appropriate monies to fight against Mexico. Not everybody in Congress or in American society was okay with this because uh, there is always a group of people in Congress um, that, are, that is ready to go to war or to for the United States to go to war because war has a possibility of making profits. And also, in this case, war means more land for the United States, which is going to create conflict. And that conflict eventually, because of that acquisition of Mexican land, is going to lead indirectly to the U.S. Civil War. So this is connected to the U.S. Civil War. Because for a very long time, the United States tried its best to uh, balance uh, a uh, a nation between slave states and free and free states, and acquiring more land means that they have to continue to make this balance, and that's going to influence what happens next. On May 13, 1846, two hours after two hours of debate, the U.S. Congress declares war and authorizes the recruitment and supply of 50,000 troops for the U.S.-Mexican War. This becomes a big deal in the United States, and now the United States and Mexico are at war with each other. There are some people who oppose this war, and one of those political groups is the Northern Whigs, who are already pushing for um, less slave states and because of the complication that this is going to this is going to create because of the war and because of the possible outcome of the war they do not support the war a young congressman from uh, Illinois demands to President Polk to show him on a map where exactly American blood was shed in American soil. This young congressman would eventually become the U.S. president, uh, the beginning of the Civil War. So as a result of this, 67 weak representatives voted against the mobilization and appropriations for war. So there is opposition to the war, but there is more support to the war. And eventually the United States moves forward with this. Other people that also were against this war included Ohio Senator Tom Corwin, who accused Polk of in, uh, involving the U.S. in a war of aggression. Uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson and Henry David Torrell. So there's persistence, there's questioning, but obviously um, a lot of this does not uh, make the headlines because it's a time of patriotism and a great opportunity for uh, people that benefit from war and also from people that is, are dreaming about expanding slavery into these uh, Mexican territories. Mexico City, the government, and intellectuals look at this as a um, move by the United States to first take over Texas by force, that the United States is hungry for more land because of manifest destiny, and Mexico must defend its national territorial sovereignty. And here we have a character of the U.S.-Mexican uh, War, who, after the fiasco of the, uh, of the San Jacinto, after the Alamo, was 
uh, not like too much, now uh, is invited back into the presidency during the beginning of the war. Antonio Lopez de Santana. From the point of view of uh, General Ulysses S. Grant, a veteran of the U.S.-Mexican War, and later on a veteran of the Civil War, and a very important uh, character in the American Civil War, in his uh, writings, where he's uh, reflecting on the U.S.-Mexican War, he acknowledges that President Pope provoked the war, and the annexation of Texas was an act of war and an act of aggression. Other world leaders, even today, like uh, the well-known uh, president of Russia, Vladimir Putin, uh, mentions uh, uh, Texas and Mexico in the United States a lot with a lot of the things that are happening in the international world. Grant uh, agonized, meaning that he, when he, well, towards the time that he was closer to dying, um, that he had to serve the American flag, but he learned from that experience how horrible this war was, and in some cases unnecessary. The U.S.-Mexican War was fought in three uh, offensives, or so three different uh, lines of attack. And this, um, I divided it into three uh, armies. So one is the Army of the West under General Kearney. Uh, this Army of the West attacks New Mexico, Santa Fe, and California. This is divided into three divisions made up of uh, 1,500 men. One goes to Santa Fe, another one goes to Chihuahua, and Stephen W. Kearney goes into California. And one of those battles that happened for uh, General Kearney was in Escondido at San Pascual Battlefield. The Army of the Center, led by General Taylor, attacks with 6,000 men uh, from going from uh, Texas all the way to northern cities of Mexico, such as Matamoros, Monterrey, Camargo, Saltillo, and Buena Vista. And then you have the Army of Occupation. This is the U.S. Navy with 10,000 men being dropped off in uh, the coastal ports of Veracruz and Tampico. In the Gulf Coast of Mexico, and this is the Army of Occupation, which eventually will take over Mexico City for nine months during uh, 1847 and 1848. This is a map of these different spots uh, that were used for the war. You can pause this and look at them if you choose to, but this shows you uh, how and where. Uh, the U.S. troops attacked Mexico from. And I will end this lecture with an image that I uh, want you to think about. I'm not promoting in any way, shape, or form alcohol, but I just think that it's interesting how Absolute Vodka published this in, uh, in various magazines where they show if the world or history would be different, this is what the United States would look like in comparison to Mexico. That's it for this lecture. Uh, see you next lecture. Take care.